parents, you, where did writing come from for you? Um, it was when I was in university, really. Started to uh, do comedy, stand-up comedy. Not as myself, because that's far too scary, uh, but as characters. Um, <laughs> and we, there was a thing called the Comedy Cellar where we would <clears throat> host, you know, Unfortunately, we got there just after people like Stu Lee and Al Murray had gone. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there were a few people who'd gone on to do stuff. And then we took over, me and a friend, and sort of did, did shows once a week. And then off the back of that, uh, I wrote something for the first time. I mean, I'd, I'd written before for, the, for the school and all that sort of charity days, things like that, version of Greece and uh <laughs> silly things um but yeah there was, there was that was the first time i thought oh okay this is quite fun i'm enjoying this um and it was all in sort of sketch form and then we did a couple of uh longer sort of half hourly things and then when i went to welsh college for a year afterwards i met uh giles who uh, we shared the same sense of humor and we can we make each other laugh and that's where that came from. And then I'd always tinker away at bits on my own, but it was great having somebody else to bounce off all the time because then they would tell you if, A, you're being a bit rubbish or something doesn't work, or you can immediately, because we're both actors, we can try stuff out and see if it works or, oh, that's too much or that character isn't quite working, I don't think. You, you just get more of a sense of it because we were coming at it from a, an actor's point of view. And often with writing, it can be a bit, Oh, how do you make this work? So we were hopefully we were cutting out a bit of that process, so it was a bit easier. So at least we were putting it in each other's mouths, as it were. Um, so do you see yourself as an an actor who writes, or a writer who acts, or it doesn't matter? Probably an actor who writes, I think. Yeah, because um, no, I'd probably do more writing now than I have ever done, um, and. So it's because people don't employ me as an actor anymore. But um, <laughs> but you know, they, uh, it became it became uh, a thing. It, it went through sort of peaks and troughs. In that we were very lucky when we started out. We did shed loads and got onto uh, radio stuff in Wales. Did a lot of sketch shows. Did half hour mock documentaries, which turned into a sort of TV series called Lucky Bag that ran for four series. And that was where we acted in it and wrote it and did the theme tune. Um, uh, so that was great and a brilliant learning ground of how to sort of get characters over quickly, how to build a character because we'd always, and we'd write for other people as well as for ourselves. And Giles wasn't in it, but he would, because uh, he was all Welshman. Um, so uh, that was also good because he was a proper outside eye and would see how it worked and he could go, oh, there's that, that's a bit rubbish. And I would write stuff on my own. He'd write stuff on his own for that as well. Um, so that was a brilliant learning ground just to get character and ideas and little stories told in a very short amount of time, really. Um, and with you, Miles, I suppose, because we've, like I, like I know you as an actor, that's how we first got together. But I remember, I do remember being in the rehearsal room with you and your just like exuberance and love of all things literature. So do you think this <laughs> calling for you to write. Is that, is, is that your love, do you think? Well, it's funny, listening, when you were asking Kieran then and when he started, my, my absolute, I don't know how to describe it, when I, that excitement of opening a new book or <laughs> starting a new story, when I was younger, I remember so clearly, and my, the one, the one thing with my parents, if I ever I asked for a book, any, you know, sweets, anything else. It was like, no, you can't, whatever. But it didn't matter what book I asked for, even if it was inappropriate. Yes, you can have all the books you want. And it was just so, and I think that, you know, I remember The Hobbit, a neighbour bought me a copy of The Hobbit. And I remember reading it and it was so, I literally remember sort of just the immersion, you know, into the story and just thinking, this is, and the need or the desire to want to create my own place like that, you know, from my head just started from there. 
and I would, I'd jot stuff down, but because we lived in the countryside, I'd be, I'd, I'd sort of create stuff outside, I'd make films. <laughs> I made a film about me on Glyndor, where I was burning all my father's cardboard boxes. <laughs> <laughs> But all this stuff, you know, but that, I think that storytelling thing, that, because there's something about, right, so Dame, Dame Edna Everidge said about acting, I love going out on stage because it's the only place I can be alone, right, which I think is brilliant. And I think the same applies for when you enter your own play, words, story world, whatever it is, I think you can apply the same meditative you know, process where you can just, you're in and then you can start playing once you've got something. And for, um, for me, I think that's, that's what it feels like. And, do you, started. and how do you see yourself now, Miles? Because you, you act on that, but do you see yourself as an actress that writes or a writer that acts? How does that? No, no, because I've, I've, because I mistakenly, I think I've tried to answer that question, but I think it, I think it leads to false kind of, I think the point is, if we naturally, all of us, want to share stories or create stories in whichever form, platform, voice, I think it's, that's cool, whichever way suits you, you know, even if it's in whatever creative exploration that should be allowed. I think labels, because I've, I've, because I've tied myself up in knots trying to answer that, going, right, I have to decide what am I? And I don't think that's true anymore. Yeah. I just, I think if the need is to share a story or to create stuff, um, characters or monologues or a, a chapter in a book or whatever, or a poem, whatever it is, or a song, then that's okay. That's fine. And, and do you both have, you know, what would be your influences from a writing perspective now? Here and self. <laughs> <laughs> Shush. No, you're not. <laughs> I've got loads. I've got loads. Can you pick, can you pick one? I, yeah, I, I, yeah, can you pick one that you, that you sort of think? Oh, I, well, obviously in different genres. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like Iris Murdoch, um, Mary Oliver, uh, playwrights obsessed with Samuel Beckett, Gwendolyn Parry, you know, that's just off the top of my head. Wonderful. And you, Kieran, what's, what's it for you, would you say? Um, I don't I did a lot of escapist stuff when I was growing up. I mean, I, I wrote my own version of The Empire Strikes Back. I, I did a novelization of it as I was growing up. And I also wrote my own uh, secret agent um, book, Agents and Papers, it was called. <laughs> at 11. Um, Have you still so that, got it? Have you still got that? Somewhere, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you want to dust it off? No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, no. Um, but yeah, I'd always, I'd always read loads, you know, and like Mally, it was that whole, being a classic example of an only child, that would be the thing. I would just go off and read whatever and went through all the sort of, like the Tolkien, the um, loads of Star wars -y sort of things. Um, and Paul Theroux and things like that, and Stephen King. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'd always be a voracious reader. I'd, I'd get through stuff and still am, you know, and that's what I really enjoy doing. Um, and that went alongside film. Um, yeah. So I'd be yeah. a bit of a, I was always a film buff. Um, and luckily I've been able to combine the both and uh, I've written some films now. But uh, yeah, which I haven't got made, but you know, <laughs> it, <laughs> it's been proper. Yeah, it's, yeah. A synergy. it's synergy. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's. Uh, <laughs> so I think that's watching films as well has influenced how, certainly how I write for TV and and also for stage. I think because it you you kind of because you can achieve so much more on stage without having to have the proper, you know, visual effects. Something can be created by a mood, and that's what's been interesting. You're going all right. I can push that as much as I want to, especially yeah. things like the white feather. We could just create little moments that didn't necessarily have to have a huge amount of setup. You go, all right, they're there now, but it's okay because they're in the light. Yeah. And you can conjure up an atmosphere very easily and you can be more daring. And same with like when Manny did Mall, um, that was wonderful because that just changed, because obviously I've adapted some stuff as well. 
um, but it was being able to trust actors you know could do it and feeling that they were going to be able to uh, take on what was there, change it a bit, obviously, because I think you've got to be, as a writer, you've got to be open to actors taking stuff on board and changing it um, and making it their own and, and, you know, finding out what works and doesn't work on the rehearsal room. And talking about that then, let's, let's go no. into the rehearsal room then as a writer, because um, I haven't, I don't think, Mally, whatever we've written, Augusta Morva probably was the thing that I directed that had been involved in writing. But yeah. as, as a writer sitting in, the other, sort of on the other side of the table then, how does that feel sometimes as an actor? It's really funny because you, because you, in a way, you want to direct on some level as well. Because they, I think there must be a control thing because those voices are in your head. And then if someone, it's having the patience to let that person discover that the character's voice, you, it's lived in you for, for long enough, you know, but you have to let them catch up. So it's quite a skill to keep your mouth shut, <laughs> I think. Because you want to go, no, no, she's not like that. Or, so, you know, but you can't, but you can't because that's why you have a four week rehearsal process because everyone comes at it with a different rhythm and, and different time scale. And it's just trusting the process, I suppose. And do you think, yeah. so on that sort of, you know, are there sometimes when you've been acting in something, have you taken that experience of being an actor and working with a writer into your writing when you're in the room? Do you know what I mean? As, as in, are there things that a writer has said to you as an actor in the past that you've gone, oh, I'm never doing that? I think it sort of depends, doesn't it, on just as um, from an acting point of view, being allowed to contribute to when I was in my family, I occasionally chucked in a few lines and having some support for them was great, which happened with some writers and not with others. So, and as the, so that was really gratifying because as a character, you felt that you could have a say in it. But watching other actors do stuff that you've written, yeah, is really nerve wracking. But then as long as you can take your ego out of it, you go, all oh, right, that doesn't really work. And you go, yeah, you're not, you're not saying it the way I want you to say it. But sometimes you go, oh, right, I've just overwritten this. You can just yeah. do all that with your face. You don't <laughs> need to, you know, somewhere you can look sad rather than talk about it for 10 minutes. So it's, and allowing that shorthand to sort of work and stripping it back and make but trusting an actor to sort of take that leap. I mean, I've learned a lot just by watching. And I've also, been, I'm quite bad at being really critical about what I do. Um, so I'm always, I'm always ready to, you know, put lines through stuff. And well, I, and I, I was going to say, Kieran, actually, because from that perspective, I remember I've worked with, as an actress, I've worked with writers including you, Kieran, who have real grace, you know, who have real, who have a real ability to go, yeah, I, can, I hear what you're saying and I'll, I'll try and implement, you know, or I'll try and absorb what you're creating up there. And there's, I think there's such a, it's so lovely when you meet writers like that, because of course they, it's all about just, it's all about that collective making something better. So mm. like you said, Kieran, the ego isn't there. It really is about, everybody's helping each other and everybody's trying to get this as good as it can be. Yeah, you've got yeah. to collaborate on every, yeah. everything. If you're, if you're a writer who comes in and says, no, that's it, you can't change a word, then you, you go, mm. but it's got to change because it's, it's what you've written. It's the same that they say with films, isn't it? You write a film, you shoot a film, and then you edit a film, and it's three different scripts, really, that you end ah. up with. Right. So the, right. first, the first version of a, of a theatre piece is you've done that in isolation, you give it to someone to rehearse, it changes, it has to change because it's not just you. And then you've got the final result, which has got all the bangs and whistles on top of it, lighting, sound, set, you know, music. It's, uh, it changes it again. And I think you've got to be willing to go along with that. If you're a fascist about, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, I've watched and I've been involved in a few things where the writer has been, no, no, you're not changing it. And you know, deep down, you go, oh my God, you, you <laughs> really don't, you could just get rid of it, but you know, 
you can't do that because that's not your job. If they've said no, they go, okay, I've somehow got to make this work then so that it's not, you know, embarrassing, not embarrassing, but I've got to make it work. Yeah, that's yeah. funny, isn't it? I love, I love that. It's that thing about, um, you know, how do you feel? Like I've been in so many situations, I suppose, what I've said to, and because also, you know, because if I've written it as well, and I'm directing it, so it's like, <laughs> so you're like yeah, this, yeah. you know, because I hear it in my head. But sometimes it's, it's your voice, isn't it? It's not a character's voice. Hmm. Sometimes you write something because you, you hear it funny because you can say it funny in your head. And then you think, <laughs> why aren't you saying it funny now? Because it was funny yeah. two days ago when I, when I wrote it. Yeah. And it's the temptation to say, say it like this. Hmm. Even though that you're, you haven't even put a character onto that as well, you know. But well, I, I, I think it's really interesting about an actor saying to an actor, or even as an actor, because I, obviously I don't act, but how do you feel when you've got a line you're thinking, oh God, this is dreadful. What do you do? What's, what, is the, what is the thing that you do that makes you, you know, able to say it with some sort of integrity, I want to say. But if, if, you can, if you can back it up, you see, if you can justify it, because sometimes as well, as, as actors, you might be wrong. You might think it's a really bad line, but actually with a bit of work, it could come good. <laughs> so if you've done, but it could, do you know what I mean? You make mistakes both ways, don't you? But if you've done your homework and you can genuinely go, she wouldn't say that because ABC or, you know, something, then you, then you can present the argument better. You, br yeah. you bring your work. So yeah, I just want to go back a little bit though on about, you know, if you, is, is there a, a book that you would absolutely love to adapt? Is this, yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot a bit now because we haven't prepped this or anything, but is there, is there a story that you go, oh my God, I'd love to see I want to nick the idea. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've got one, it's been done. It's been done, but my, my one was always um, The Master of Margarita and Complicity did it a few years yes, ago. Yeah, yeah. And I went to see it at the Barbican. Right? And it's notoriously hard to do because it's yeah. just... There are, there's, a, there's a plot, subplot, and also the, the magical elements of it are so... They're so intrinsic, but impossible to put on stage. That's the whole... And even in film, you know, there's an old Russian version that's online and it's just, and it's brilliant, but you, you just can't shifting his brain onto a visual thing is really difficult, but Complicity did it right. And apparently they all argued, and they had a terrible <laughs> time. but I went to see it and, um, and I was sat next to this couple and I cried all the way through. I cried all the way through and this poor woman was trying to make me feel better because I was so moved that they'd managed to do it because there's bits like Margarita gets, um, uh, uh, one of the characters, sorry, gets, has to escape on, on the back of a horse and it flies, right? And it's a really important part of the story. <laughs> and no. what they did, they projected this gallop, giant galloping horse on, on the floor, on the stage she lay on it like she was on top of a horse. They filmed it and projected it onto the back screen. Wow. And so she's, and I was in tears. Like I go, they've done it. They've got the galloping horse. You know, but that for me, if they, but also there are wonderful duologues in um, Master and Margarita between Pontius Pilate and Jesus, right? And that's, because I'm obsessed with duologues, I just think, because it's a meeting of minds and there's this rhetoric and they're just back and forth, back and forth. So I, that, I could, if I could isolate that, I would, I would le I'd love to do that. But... That's amazing. What about you, Kieran? I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I've been lucky enough to do a few ones that I like. I, was, I want, always wanted to do ghost stories on stage, which we did with Mapamundi with Still Life, which was a few Edgar Allan Poe short stories and M.R. James short stories, because I think the possibilities there are great. And if you're gonna be scared, to be scared in the theater is uh, great because 
you know, it's easy to do it on film because you're directed all the time and you, you've got all those extra elements, but to do it in a live space, I think is, is really, really good and really chilling. And we managed to, I think, pull, pull it off for a couple of the stories at least. Yeah. And all through practical things, we didn't have a lot of jiggery pokery. Had some magicians in on it, which was fabulous, uh, Morgan and West. And they were great. And you're going, oh, is that all it is? Is that all the magic? <laughs> Look over there, mostly. <laughs> but yeah, it was just but it was brilliant. Yeah. It was brilliant. Um, and that was good fun. But yeah, I mean, it's tricky, isn't it? Because every, I think everything you read, everything influences you, whether you like it or not. And you would just become a huge sponge. And then you go, oh, crikey, I've written something. And it's a bit, got a bit of that in it, and a bit of this in it. And I think that's where you just have to be open to not reordering and not nicking stuff, but everything mm -hmm. does kind yeah. of end up swirling about and you might end up finding something in something you hated, but works really well or the same sort of element works really well in another form. Um, certainly as actors, you cherry pick from other people, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like looking at, you know, because we've talked a lot recently about what the future of theatre is going to be and, you know, how it's going to, how it's going to present itself and who, who are we going to be presenting to in the future? Um, and looking at trying to bring on not so much younger writers, but perhaps new writers. Do you have, again, this is really putting you on the spot, but is there like a nugget of advice? that you would give somebody who was saying, I want to write specifically for theatre, because I think that's, you know, my love anyway. And, you know, is this something that you would say, you know, something that you could pass on to them? Not saying that you're all like, sort of like old and wizened and things. But is there anything that you would... Because I'm inundated, you know, with new writers and people who, oh, I've got an idea, I've got an idea, you know. Good idea, this will be a great story, or this will be a great show for an or whatever. What would you say to people who are coming coming to us with ideas and things? And oh, do you want me to go, Kieran? Yes, okay. go, I, it's a re it's really annoying because it's the one that annoys me. I think, oh, shut up, can't you give me better advice than that? But it is just to keep writing. That's all. There's nothing else you can do. You have to keep. You have to keep doing it then you literally, whatever you've written, you need to put it aside for a couple of days or a month or whatever. And you'll always, when you come back to read it, you'll be like, oh, that's shocking. And then you instinctively, you'll know what to change and what doesn't work. And I think the thing about if it's, if you're talking about theatre, you know, it's that, I suppose it's that thing of, in, in, you know, it's, it's conversations, isn't it? It's really nailing how we really speak. I think it's that thing. And, that, and I think that's just listening. It's mm -hmm. listening, listening and absorbing. That's interesting, actually, because I think that's... It's, it's funny as now as you sort of... You're aware of the notes that you give actors and things like that. But one of the ones that I've been given quite a lot recently you know, say recently, you know, in the last couple of years, is this thing of like, oh, I don't believe you're listening to one another on stage. Yep. Really, it's, it's fascinating, actually, because you know, especially with shows that perhaps if we've done them, you know, if we bring a show back and so you have the same cast and so it's, there's like a real ease because they know the show, they know the show works. And then you think, yeah, but actually, I don't, you're, on, you're on like, it's like you're rattling through it. You're not actually, you're so familiar with it that you're not actually listening for that moment. It's, not, it's, it's also that you're not trusting it because we'd have lessons at Lambda on listening. <gasps> and, wow. And, and honestly, and it's, but we were like, oh, what? <laughs> you know, because you'd have to, because what you're doing is you're preempting mm. your turn to speak. And it's a real, it's a real lesson skill some people have it inherently just to trust that you are absolutely living in that moment and when they finish speaking you'll know what to say obviously you've learned your lines and you've been in rehearsals but because what you and what children do you know the whole mouthing thing oh, yeah. we speak we we do the same we just don't give it away but our mind 
just going, you're going to speak, you're going to speak, or, you know, whatever it is, I'll wait for the cue, light cue, and then I'll speak, you know, but it, it's the, it's, there's a real, it's practice, just being in the moment, and then, and then lifting when the, when the time comes to speak. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Acting is reacting, you see, isn't it? That's what they say. <laughs> but yeah, I think I'd agree with uh, Mally in that you just splurge everything out. Just get it all out first. And then you've got whatever it is. You can whittle away at it and sculpt it and change it so that it makes more sense. I think if you don't... And just have the courage to do it and uh, get it out there. Because that's a lot of the problem as well, is that you go, oh, no, I can't, can't put this down. Oh, I don't know how to do it. But then as soon as you do it then you've, at least you've accomplished something, you've got something out there, and then you can start to shape it better. I mean, that's certainly how I approach stuff now. We always, like, blast through something, then reassess. I mean, again, writing is rewriting. Yeah. Um, so it's all about changing stuff, making it better, getting rid of stuff you don't need. And you, as you say, Manny, you, you don't know that until you've got to the end of something. Mm, you yeah. can read it back or leave it for a bit revisit it and go oh my god what was I thinking I was just terrible terrible uh, yeah <laughs> so I think that definitely would be a, a th something I'd advise just to do it uh, and keep doing it and then be prepared to like not expect that to be fine <laughs> they're going well, yeah. I've written it now you go no no well, you, you need to maybe change bits yeah and then as long as you've got someone giving you good notes um, then that's that's great if you've got someone who's just on some things we've had you know notes for reasons because somebody thought they had to give notes um, and that can be very frustrating because you go, well, that's just that's not what we that if you've read it properly you know that that's not right and would you write if you weren't if that was new job so you did something else and not, not involved, would you still write, do you think? I think yeah. everybody, yeah. Because ultimately it wasn't my job, you know, to begin with. And so <laughs> I just ended up doing it. And it's gone, oh, there we are. This, I quite enjoyed that. I don't think it's something you can switch off very easily unless you are really in the doldrums and not uh, things aren't working or whatever. There's always got to be some sort of release there. Because that's what you did in the first place. You, you, you must have, there must have been a reason for you to do it. Because otherwise you, why would anyone go into this industry? Acting and writing. Goodness me, if they didn't love it, there'd be no point. Or if they didn't feel they had to. So, yeah. Okay, and just to finish then, I've got two questions. One is your favourite play, or the play that you would have loved to have written. I know. Hard, isn't it? I think that one. No, The Crucible. Ah. Oh. If I had written The Crucible, I'd be kissing myself all the <laughs> Well done, Miles. Well done. You're a genius! <laughs> yeah, well, it's brilliant. Kieran, I, do like the I don't know, I don't know. It's Did a forgot of Kieran. Oh, that's my second one. Is it? No. Yeah. I'm giving it to you, but you oh. don't want it, obviously. <laughs> Um, I do, uh, you know, yeah, it sounds, you know, Shakespeare, I, Hamlet, and I was very lucky to do that. But it was, that was an amazing experience. And also you do go, bloody hell, he knew exactly what he was doing. And there's loads of stuff in it. I know it's often maligned and people go, mm. but yeah, when it works and you get a production that works, it's fantastic. And I'm very lucky because again, that again, that's sort of where I started out, straight out of drama school in, into doing about a dozen Shakespeare plays. And that was just a massive education. And again, you find out stuff about story. Here's some of his stories are absolutely ludicrous. The whole, <laughs> any comedy is like, what? The identical twins and then everybody shows up in the last act. It's not. <laughs> and the, oh yes, I'm your cousin. Oh, wow. So lots of it is really frustrating, but there's always like really amazing gems within it that says so much about life. Um, I'm, I'm gutted I haven't done a Shakespeare. 
because I cool. no because um we did it you know because Lambda's classically is a classical course so mm. we did Shakespeare the whole time but I've never <gasps> but once I left I've never done a Shakespeare oh I'm surprised that's it yeah and then the last question is because I'm asking everybody this is that you know when there's a feature film about theatre and an org Hmm. Who would you cast as yourself? I think. <laughs> I mean, School of Rock, Jack Black. Oh. Sometimes, you know that that level. Obviously, he's probably a bit more energetic than me, but that kind of joie de vie. Or maybe that's just wish fulfillment on my behalf. <laughs> And that or, or Steve Martin. Steve oh. Martin and Harrison Ford. Oh. Yes. Sort of <laughs> Steve Martin and Harrison Ford at their peak, you know. <laughs> that was sort of I was gonna say I was gonna say it has to be Harrison Ford for you. Yeah. Surely. I'm trying to be realistic to begin with and then well, I sod it. <laughs> I'm not gonna be realistic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm complete fantasy land. Go on, Miles. Well, um, I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm going to say Kate Blanchett, oh, yeah. only because I like her, uh, or um, what's her name, Carol, is it Carol Burnett, who played Miss Hannigan in the original Annie? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs>